Hi, everybody. How are you all? I'm glad that you guys all made it on. Um, I'm the food safety specialist with the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative. I've been here for about a year now. Previously to my position here, I was with the Klamath Trinity Resource Conservation District. Um, we're a tribal nonprofit based in Hoopa, California. I'm a Hoopa tribal member. Um, I am a mother of six, and so food is really important in my home, especially I have four teenage boys in the house. And so um, I'm glad to be able to kind of share some of my expertise and how we were able to up and get going a farmer's market in our tribal community. So I'm gonna kick it off. I'm gonna turn on uh, my screen. Um, please feel free to um, drop any questions or comments in the chat and Mary Bell will be moderating those. And when we get little times in to pause, uh, she'll be letting me know that there's a question in the chat. So feel free to drop any type of question in between. And we appreciate you guys all joining. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. All right, so this series is um, intended to kind of give some insight on how to start a farmer's market. We're just going to go over an overview on, you know, starting a farmer's market 101, um, how we started one in Hoopa, and, um, you know, how it's been able to continue to um, go on for over the last few years and, you know, what it's doing now and what we look forward to doing in the future. Again, IFAI was started at the University of Arkansas School of Law by Dean um, uh, Stacy Leeds, the founding director, Janie Sims Hip, in 2013. Our mission is to enhance health and wellness in tribal communities by advancing healthy food systems, diversified economic development, and cultural food traditions in Indian country. That's who we are. Um, you know, when we started our farmer's market, you know, we were kind of like, where do we begin? Um, it's kind of like a question that, you know, we had to ask ourselves. We um, at the Climate Trinity Research Conservation District was a tribal nonprofit. Um, we were formed underneath the umbrella of the tribe. And so we're not a, like a 501c3. We are a tribal nonprofit. So we actually operate underneath our tribe's sovereignty. And so we had started in 2007 uh, initially i was i began in 2011 in this in that position and started working with them um they began you know the groundwork of developing their five-year plan and developing you know their bylaws and their um, articles of incorporation with the department of commerce at the hoopa valley tribe all of those things were kind of the initial starting of the rcd and so when I came on, um, they had already had established a CSA program, a community supported agriculture program, uh, which they put together shares weekly and were giving out produce, um, you know, that people wanted to buy. It was $10 at the time uh, for a box of produce. Um, so we were th talked around and kicked around the thought of a farmer's market. And so we were trying to figure out where do we begin, right? So the first thing that I would um, recommend to beginning is to look into your tribal codes. Um, if you are going to be developing this on the tribal reservation or within a tribal community, how those tribal codes are enforced and enacted in your community. Um, so for us, we operate again underneath the tribe's sovereignty. Uh, we operate under, we operated under Title 54, which is a tribal nonprofit code. We also have a supplemental food code, um, which is Title 56.2 um, of the Hoopa Valley Tribes Codes. And so we took and looked at those codes and how we can start to form um, this organization uh, or this uh, farmer's market. You know, we wanted to make sure that the farmers that were bringing the produce there were underneath the guidelines of our food code, whether we had, you know, food safety, value added product that was being sold there, all those types of things. And then also we went through and looked at uh, USDA. Uh, oh, sorry. Let's see. USDA support, like where can we leverage funding for this program and for the farmer's market? We looked into SNAP benefits um, because we knew that there was a, a ability for a farmer's market to accept um, EBT or food stamps. And so we wanted to see like how we could get that instituted within our farmer's market. 
We wanted to, um, you know, work with the tribal producers um, and the non-tribal producers that were actually helping with the CSA program that we had at the time, how we could build that tribal producer population and how we could build, you know, this um, um, core group of people that were going to be able to help us uh, with the farmer's market. And then the next thing was the community buy-in. And so getting the community wanting to go to farmer's market and how that looks. So when we're going over our tribal law, you know, does your tribe have specific regulatory codes for commerce? You know, we have a Department of Commerce here in Hoopa. Um, each one of our vendors can go to Hoopa and get a business license. Um, you know, we have um, a, a place where you can pay for like if you're doing like a pop up stand, like you're doing like a Indian taco stand, all those types of things, you go and you pay the Department of Commerce or you go in and put in a permit through our Department of Commerce uh, for that. And then again, you know, falling under those guidelines of your food code, does your tribe have a food code? What's in those food codes? You know, is there anything that, you know, you're going to want to watch out for um, so that you're not breaking any tribal, tribal laws um, within that food code? So we looked at those types of things. What roles does food safety play in your planning of the market? You know, a lot of the things like with our farmers, we had them take the produce safety training. We wanted to make sure that, you know, those that were accessing the food that came from our market, um, that food was safe for consumption. A lot of the produce that comes through farmer's market is going to be consumed raw so that we always know that those are the ones that we want to be very aware of and, and how that food, you know, was harvested you know, was there, you know, food safe practices in place for that? Um, you know, what role does, uh, you know, your value added product um, under, is there a code underneath your food code, like a cottage foods licensing in your community? Those types of things are important with, the, you know, knowing what the tribal law is on your reservation or even the local law, if you're not on, if you're on a non-reservation place, um, how does SNAP authorization look like, you know, and we'll get into this in, in further, but how do you get a, an EBT machine? How do you set those up and how do you become a retailer of SNAP? And then for off the reservation, your state lands, uh, these questions are also valid. So you want to just kind of like thinking about, you know, even if you're not starting it on the reservation, you know, what's the food codes there? What's food safety look like there? You know, do people have to have their um, food handlers cards, those types of things. So you want to make sure that you have those things in place as you're starting to develop your farmer's market. So our market here in Hoopa is called Monday Night Market. It's a tribal nonprofit established farmer's market. Um, it started in 2017 um, underneath the Klamath Trinity Resource Conservation District. Um, and the Conservation District is a nonprofit formed underneath the Hoop Valley Tribe Sovereign Business Codes. We, we were a standalone organization authorized under the umbrella of the Hoopa Valley Tribe. We also had an MOU with the Hoopa Valley Tribe where we have autonomy um, from the tribal government and we're able to operate as a standalone op organization. The KTRCD started the Hoopa Monday Night Farmers Market. Um, Hoopa has a supplemental food code again, going back to that tribal law, along with business licensing um, that processes through our Department of Commerce. Um, this is an example of using tribal sovereignty to initiate tribally led economic development and promoting a local food economy. Um, our Monday night markets, um, when we first started them, um, it was it was pretty like, you know, touch and go in the beginning. We started it at the community garden. So the KTRCD manages a community garden in Hoopa. And a lot of people didn't know where the community garden was. And so that was kind of a issue was the location when we first started. So we're like, okay, our first year we had like three or four vendors. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of food production vendors, like produce production vendors. Um, we had a couple people that were selling wool. Um, we had people that were selling like some produce. Um, we had different items like value added product, like jams, jellies, and salsas those kinds of things. Um, so it was really limited in the beginning. 
And so when we started up in the next year, we decided that we wanted to change the location of the farmer's market into a centralized location that the community members had, you know, access or that it was like a focal point where people were going all the time. So we set up next to the um, bank in Hoopa. Um, if you've ever been to Hoopa, it is a very remote reservation. We don't have like uh, stoplights, taxis or anything like that. So, you know, it's like we have one store, one gas station, we have a bank. Um, so, you know, we have a post office, those kinds of things. And so we wanted to put it in an area where uh, people frequently went to. And so the bank was always an area that people um, accessed a lot. And so we first started up there, we talked to our Department of Commerce. Uh, we talked to our, we at the time, um, our permitting process went through our plant management department. And so we filled out applications so we can set up markets there. Um, and, you know, it became a lot more frequently um, attended just due to the location change. And so that was a big thing. Um, this picture right here is one of our farmer's market. This was uh, during COVID. Um, it, we moved over to this area because they were building something or they were doing some construction work um at the uh bank so this is actually next to our gas station it's just right across the street from the bank and so basically we would set up as you can see it's like a um uh cement parking lot and we had a bunch of vendors that started to come um that was really good uh having that location change uh, we started advertising, and so we realized that, you know, trying to hit social media, trying to get advertisement in the paper, those types of things was really getting people involved in the farmer's market. You know, as we began to develop our core group of producers, you know, we started to think about, like, the produce safety um, role underneath the Food Safety Modernization Act and how that played a part in our community. So we wanted to make sure that our producers had available trainings um, that they could attend. So we actually partnered with Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative. Uh, they were providing the grower safety training back in 2017. And so we actually were able to have them come up here in about 2018, right after we started our first market. And they provided the first um, produce safety training with our tribal producers at the time. I think we had about 10 producers that were certified. Um, this training goes over like safe handling practices, uh, water quality, um, you know, how to uh, have risk risk. Risk reduction and what the human pathogens and how that that can transfer over to your produce so that you know you're not you're able to re reduce those risks and making sure that your produce that you're selling is safe. Um, so it goes over tons of different things, handling, hygiene, those types of things. Um, I am the food safety specialist with the Indigenous Food and Ag Initiative. Um, so if you're interested in your community and having a grower's training, please contact me. Uh, my contact information is on the flyer. Um, we provide it for tribal communities, tribal producers, free of charge. Um, it would be me coming out and providing this training for, you know, any producers or any farms that are up and going, especially if you want to start a farmer's market. Uh, we wanted to have this because we have a lot of elders and children that access the food in our at our farmer's market. So we wanted to make sure that that food was safe for consumption. We've partnered with the Tribal TANF program here in Hoopa, and they were um, providing vouchers for their clients to access uh, produce from, from the farmer's market. We also, um, you know, which we'll get into further detail, we are a SNAP retailer, so we take EBT benefits. Um, so we were able to, um, you know, be able to allow people to use their cards there, swipe them, and then use their um, EBT benefits to purchase produce from our vendors. We also um, have a elder voucher program. And so we have a bunch of elders that come through our farmer's market weekly and, you know, they they buy from this um, from our producers. So we wanted to make sure that everyone that was selling produce at the market had this produce safety training. So we wanted to ensure that people were accessing safe nutritional food. Again, if you have a food code that's established and authorized under the tribe, 
Um, you can use their produce safety and their value added section of that code. If not, I would refer to the Food Safety Modernization Act um, or FISMA and find out what their guidelines are and how that is applicable to your um, community where you will be establishing this farmer's market. We also provided food preservation training classes to the community so that we can build that value added product business production. But also, you know, that that uh, training has a lot of food safety components that go into like how to safely process, you know, jams, jellies, uh, whatever you might be selling that might be a value added product at our farmer's market. So one of the things that was a core to uh, getting our farmer's market up and going is not only just having producers, but having, you know, food that was there, but that was safe for human consumption. Because again, you know, our most vulnerable population was accessing this food and that was our elders and our tribal youth. And so we wanted to make sure they were as safe as possible. I am a Hoopa tribal member. And, you know, when, when we have these farmers markets and stuff, you know, I always look out and I see like my cousins, my aunties, my uncles, you know, my family members and each one of these people are super important to me in my community and I really love my people. And so, you know, one of the things that was at the core of this was just to make sure that, you know, I was overseeing a farmer's market that I could be assured into knowing that the food that was sold there was going to be safe for my grandmothers, my aunties, my uncles, my family members. And so that was a big component into putting this food safety as a part of our core of developing our, um, our farmer's market. I see our chat filling up. Mary Bell, do we have any questions? We've just had a few that I've been able to answer, um, like regarding tribal food and ag code. So links to our tribal food and ag code website. And then I've also included contact information for you and to the nativefoodsafety.org website for anyone who might want to reach out about us coming out and doing any food preservation or food safety courses. So, yeah. And so I didn't really touch on the, the, um, food preservation classes, but I also provide those from IFAI as well. Um, I'm a master food preserver, so I teach a done, um, an array of food preservation ones that we're talking about water bath canning, pressure canning, dehydration, um, freezing, and fermentation of foods. And so I teach that um, as part of, you know, on staff at IFAI. I do know, um, you know, traditional foods too, and that preservation, like wild game, um, traditional berries. Um, we we do a lot of acorn stuff here in Hoopla, so like that acorn processing, that type of stuff. So, if you want to hit us up for that as well, we'd love to come out to y'all's community and and definitely provide that as well. All right. So one of the biggest things. Um, that had benefited our farmer's market was being a SNAP authorized vendor. And so being a SNAP authorized retailer, um, how does that work, right? You want to make sure you know how your organization operates. So knowing the Klamath Treaty Resource Conservation District was formed underneath the Hoopa Valley Tribes business codes, you know, that was kind of something that was not familiarized with the local field office when I first started. You know, nobody understood what tribal sovereignty meant and how that worked um, and how we could actually be an authorized vendor. So I, you know, worked with some field offices and trying to put together my SNAP um, application. Um, and, you know, a lot of them didn't understand it. And so I actually met with the regional guy. Um, his name was Michael Ladd. He works for the FNS um, USDA. Um, kind of a funny story. It kind of happened in a in a, a roundabout cool way that you know I I definitely think it was like God and how he actually met with me as he kind of ended up on the doorstep of the KTRCD, um, and I had said, "Hey, while you're here." I'm having an issue with this FNS application and I'm trying to figure out why the local field office doesn't understand the tribe's sovereignty, doesn't understand how um, our organization operates. And so we worked together and putting that application together and we were able to get authorization. And so it was really cool because, you know, I had been getting so much um uh, pushback from the local field office and not understanding uh, our tribe's authority, not understanding our organization and how we operated. 
uh, one of the things that was a big um, how to was like, how is the tribe and the RCD, how are, how do they have um, separation, like the, what I talked about, the autonomy um, and, you know, how are they a standalone organization and our title 54 uh, nonprofit code totally outlines on how our organization is authorized underneath our tribe sovereignty. And so making sure you know how your organization operates, making sure that you know how your tribe operates, that's going to be very instrumental in putting together this uh, SNAP authorization application. And you want to file the proper paperwork through SNAP. Picking the right machine was another thing um, because we were a farmer's market that was, um, you know, mobile or or not in a building. Um, we were outdoor. Um, so we had a wireless machine and that wireless machine had to have, um, you know, like Internet or wireless capabilities because it, you know, swiping and then getting on online. So we had to pick the proper machine for our need. Um, also, our machine accepts credit card or ATM as well. And so it's been really beneficial because we've actually had people come through our farmer's market that didn't want to run to the ATM really quick and buy any money. So they would just actually swipe their card. So making sure that you pick the right machine is very important when you're doing this. Um, and then applying for SnapEd. Um, one of the things that had been great about our farmer's market is us applying for the local SNAP Ed through our local county department. This SNAP Ed uh, uh, funding actually has market match for it. And so basically, if a person comes and swipes their EBT and they swipe $20, we'll give them an additional $20 of market match for them to spend at the farmer's market. This has been a huge benefit, not only for them as a uh, as a recipient, but also the vendors and the producers um, that are getting that additional funding from that market match through that SNAP Ed grant. We're also able to give out vouchers and that's our tribal elder voucher program. Um, we also have vouchers for those that are an SSI, SSD. Um, so they just come and it's literally a self-certified thing. We don't require income looking at, we don't require any information about your SSI, SSD. We usually just say, okay, you tell us that you're an SSI, SSD recipient. Um, we were okay with that. Uh, most of us know every one of our tribal elders that come to the farmer's market. So we just like, you know, most of us just say, what's your address, what's your phone number, and we sign them up on site. Um, one thing that I can say about our tribal elder voucher program has been such a blessing and a, um, you know, a great thing for our elders. It gives them a sense of community because they, you know, they're very on it. They're like, if I miss a Monday night market, they let me know, like, hey, Megan, where I went to market and it wasn't set up, what happened, you know, and they'll, they're like on it because that's a place for them to go to weekly, a place for them to interact with people, a place for them to get, you know, access to food, you, you know, that they need for the week or whatever. So they're very dependent on their farmer's market and their vouchers. Um, you know, one of the things that has just been such a great thing is um, watching our elders come through and, you know, their relationship that they have established with our vendors because they know them all. Um, and, you know, they know them on not only just uh, they've been coming to farmer's market, but they know them because they're from our community. They're tribal people or they're, you know, they live in Hoopa. And so that has been so great for them because they are able to also visit. And it's a sense of their community and it's a sense of them, you know, having a place where they belong and they they can access safe nutritional foods. And so this SNAP Ed funding is really great. And having that ability to be a SNAP authorized vendor has really, really um, helped our farmer's market get up and going. But also our producers really benefit from this. You know, like they are so happy that they have the voucher program and that they have the market match program. Um, you know, we used to have producers that would... Um, they would not only have stay at our farmer's market, but they would also go to the farmer's market in uh, the neighboring community. And then, you know, on the coast, which was like 60 miles away. And they said that they would do better at our farmer's market because of the market match and because of the um, out, uh, voucher program. 
that they would just wanted to just stay and just do our farmer's market only. And so it's a huge benefit for producers, especially if they're up and coming and, you know, they're, they're a new business or they're a new, um, you know, farm that they can have this like market stability with these vouchers and with this market match. Do we have any questions? Yeah, we do have a question, um, which you might be able to expand on this, Francine, if you would like to come off mute, but how would this apply to an on-farm farmer's market? Oh, no, I just I wanted to know how it, would this all apply to an on-farm farmer's market? Because that's what I'm looking at, setting one up on my farm. Because, like, I have a lot of products that I bring. Um, and in order for me, instead of bringing it out of my my home, uh, to bring them here, you know, would all these same benefits, like the SNAP and everything like that, be um, eligible for an on-farm market? Yeah, so um, there is a retailer application. I think Mary Bell can drop it into the chat um, that you can apply. And it doesn't necessarily have to only be a farmer's market. You can actually apply as a pop-up farm or like a pop-up stand, they call them, like a farmer's market, or not a farmer's market, but a producer stand. Um, so individuals can apply for, uh, for SNAP benefits or to be a SNAP retailer, sorry. Okay, thank you. I have a couple more as well. I knew this would be a hot, hot one, which we are going to dive more into this in our future series, just letting everyone know that. So we will get into the nitty gritty of federal programs and opportunities there. Um, but what POS system do you use to accept credit and debit and EBT? And also any struggles with getting it set up to be able to accept EBT after getting your authorization letter? So there there it wasn't too bad we go through payment springs um which is a snap authorized vendor um you can pick they once you set up your authorization through fns they will send you like a vendor um name like where they have like contact information of any vendor that you can go through and so we chose Payment Springs um we also were able to secure funding from the local north North Coast Growers Association, where they had like a mini grant that we could apply for, and they paid for our um, machine and they paid for like our um, so there's like an access fee what that you have to use monthly. So they paid for our access fee for like the first two years. And so that's what we used. Um, I'd have to look at the system to know exactly what the make and model is, but I definitely could email that to you guys um, once I look at it. But we went through Payment Springs as our as our vendor for buying that. We have a couple more um, on this, and then I'll let us go on to the next one. If we have any more SNAP related questions, we can take those at the end. But okay. where does the match for the SNAP dollars come from um, that you give to the people when they use their EBT card? And can you accept WIC? Which I know, again, we're going to go into WIC in more detail and have hopefully some other staffers from IFAI who are well more versed in WIC on our next webinar too. But I'll let you take that away on the, the uh, match funds and WIC. Yeah, so it's called SNAP Ed. Um, it's a program under FNS. It's, you know, the same like the SNAP program and it's uh, ran through our local uh, county right now. So we apply for this um, SNAP ed funding from our local county and uh, you, we include different things in the SNAP ed grant. Um, we include like our, our community garden management. We commute, uh, we um, put in like our food preservation classes that we do, but we also have the market match in there. So we put a certain amount that we're going to use over the market season in that market match. And then we spend those dollars by matching with the EBT. And so what we created were these wooden tokens. Um, we I have, I'm like a jack of all trades. So like, um, I have like this sublimation machine and I bought these like wooden tokens and then I just print it like $5 on it, $1 on them. And those wooden tokens are just like, you know, any type of money you would hold on to. Um, so we, once they swipe and say they have $40 worth of tokens, I'll ask them, do you want $5 ones or do you want $1 ones? And they'll tell me how they want their money broken down. And so we give those coins to them and then they go use them from any one of our vendors. 
um, with our vouchers, it's a paper. Um, and so we, we have like little papers that say we put the date on there uh, just because they can't like come back and use additional funding that they had left over. Say like, say they spent $7 on their vouchers and they didn't spend three. They can't actually use those $3 again. So we have to reissue new papers every week. And so we just write out and then each one of our vendors, they know the protocol with the um, vouchers. And so they write on their like their name, the amount that that um, that that voucher recipient had used at their uh, stand. And then at the end of each uh, market, those vendors come to us and they um, basically give us the coins and the vouchers that they accept that day and we give them back the funding. And so that's how we use that snap ed funding, but you can apply with it through any one of your county. Um, so we use the humble county for our snap ed application and then we we put the market match into there. All right, so we can go on to the next slide. Uh, again, if you're finding issues with accessing some of these programs, some of the field offices not, might not be familiar with how this works. I definitely uh, recommend to contact your regional or national offices, um, especially with regards to tribal sovereignty. They just might not know and understand it. And so a lot of these regional and national offices understand tribal sovereignty. Uh, definitely hit up IFAI if you have any issues um, and we could be able to help, you know, get you in touch with the right person. But I think Mary Bell has the link to the regional offices of FNS um, that she can drop into the chat. All right, USDA support. Uh, we, you know, when we're looking at funding, you want to leverage funding from programs like rural development. Again, SNAP Ed um, was something that we talked a lot about in the last slide, but rural development was a uh, program that we accessed. We accessed their community facilities grant. Um, we were able to get tables, chairs, and pop ups with that grant which was really great um, for our farmer's market just because we do have um, a, a couple of elder vendors that um, are producers. And so they really enjoy the fact that they can pull up to the farmer's market with their produce. And, you know, we have a table and a pop-up ready for them. They don't have to worry about packing those out or getting those things. And so they're super thankful that we have that. Um, that's one thing that our market provides that really supported our vendors. And it's something that has been beneficial to having that, um, that market up and going and being successful. You know, you want to access the FNS for the SNAP authorization and the machine. You know, want to work with USDA to become a WIC certified vendor as a tribal organization. Um, we're hoping that we can get a couple of our IFAI staff on the next uh, farmers market series uh, webinar series so that they can go more in depth. This has kind of been an issue that we're finding uh, for our um, farmers market is becoming WIC certified across the board. We do have vendors that have WIC certification. Uh, but we don't have all of our vendors that have WIC certification. And so we're working with um, USDA to try to break down this barrier so that all of our vendors can have this certification. And we can actually talk more in depth of that process um, on our next series. But it's something that is in the works for our farmer's market um, that we're trying to get going. One thing I could say about having, you know, the support of USDA, um, you know, we work also with the Natural Resource Conservation Services. Um, they help our producers with conservation planning and being able to get the most benefit from like their soil management, um, rotational uh, crop planning, those kinds of different things. So having that extra USDA support with regards to you know developing our farmers market cohort and our our producers has been beneficial um also having them so I wanted to highlight that as well so you know if you're going to have a farmers market you're definitely going to need producers or vendors you know they're going to be the backbone of your market in the next series, we're going to definitely talk about how to build out this cohort uh, and this population of vendors for your community. But, you know, just to kind of give a brief overview, right now we have about 15 to 20 vendors that we have. Um, we also not only have produce production, 
um, and value added product producers, but we also have like hot food vendors. Um, so we have like sometimes a food truck that pulls up and, and sells, uh, you know, tacos or just, you know, like they even have like nachos and hot dogs and, and different things in, the, in their food trucks that pull up. And so having this core network of vendors is important. And a lot of it's just been from how we've built that over the years. It's just being a consistent market and making sure that we, you know, show up every Monday and that we're going to be there. And so building out that vendor population has been something that has been uh, you know, a work in progress, but I can say that consistency has been able to build out a network of vendors that have been the backbone of the Monday night markets. Uh, we're going to definitely go into depth on things and ways that you can help your, your vendor, um, network and, and be able to build up that population in your community. Uh, Hoopa again is super remote. Um, the nearest chain store is about 60 miles away. So if we're looking at like Walmart or Costco or any of those types of stores, it's about 60 miles away. We have a small tribal store, um, in our community. Uh, and one great thing is that because we have, uh, provided the produce safety training that that store actually accepts produce from our vendors and that, that produce is sold in our own store, which has been great um, for, for those vendors that have been able to take that course and being able to use that certification, um, not only just at our farmer's market, but at our local store. And so making sure that they have a, a, a access to a consistent market has been a, um, a benefit for them and making sure that they have, you know, things that would be a barrier, whether it is having this training um, so that they can sell uh, consistently. Do we have any questions about, um, you know, your produce, your producers and your vendors in the chat? No, we currently do not. Um, still a couple from earlier, but we'll address those at the end, I think. Okay, perfect. This is one of our vendors. He's been very consistent. Um, he has some of the best berries, um, by the way. And so, uh, he also does a bunch of different things, but his berries are super good. Like he does Logan berries and blueberries, super good. Now, another thing is that community buy-in, you know, creating events that are relevant to your community. The KTR City, we host an annual Blackberry Festival. We are in a, a rural place with a bunch of blackberries all over the place. Um, it's one of our like huge uh, economic, um, you know, ventures that we can go on if people want to pick berries, sell berries, make blackberry pie, all those kinds of things. It's it's definitely an economic stimulant is having our blackberry, but it also is like one of those things that it's like a vein of our existence is like fighting blackberry brush all the time. But, you know, we live in harmony here in Hoopa with the blackberries. So it's, you know, it's, it's a love-hate relationship and we definitely appreciate them, but we definitely, you know, hate them at sometimes too. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do is a Blackberry Festival. Um, it's been really successful. We're going to be, we just had our uh, our second year. We're going to be able to go into our third year coming, no, our fourth year. Sorry, this is this was our second year flyer. Um, but we're going into our fourth year of hosting our annual Blackberry Festival. It's been really cool because our vendors get very creative with this. They have like Blackberry cotton candy. Blackberry ice, like the ices, um, or like blackberry snow cones, uh, blackberry uh, lemonade. Um, we've had those that have made blackberry barbecue sauce and put it on chicken. Um, there's so many different things that we have. And one of the cool things that we do is a blackberry pie contest um, where the winner can receive a hundred bucks. Um, it's like a, a, a title around here that people wear very proudly as being the blackberry pie, uh, winner of the year. And so we're able to help, uh, with that by giving them a hundred dollars too. So it's a great incentive. It's really neat because we, we set up a booth where we have, um, you know, we, we, have number one through whatever as many entries that we have and we have like the elders that come through and they take a sample of it and then they vote on which one of their was their favorite pie uh, that they ate and so it's something that is a really great um uh 
benefit for our community and and it's a great thing to see as well so that's very widely attended um last year we did a because uh, our last farmer's market actually ended on Indigenous People's Day. So we did an Indigenous farmer's market where we had a lot of uh, food that was, you know, very much uh, modeled underneath our traditional foods within our community, like acorn soup. Um, you know, we had some people that did some deer meat. Um, it was really neat because it it bring together um, our foods that are, are traditionally um, made and people were excited. My kids actually played, um, they have a, they have a band called the neighbors. They played music there. Uh, it was really funny because it was one of those nights that was like a rainy night and the lights went out, but the show continued. And so it was really neat. We just popped up a generator and the music kept going and people kept attending it. And it was really a great event, but hosting those events that are very relevant to your community and brings a sense of your community together is, is definitely ways that you can get people into your farmer's market. And so we're going to definitely highlight this more in our series and, you know, how we use um, advertisements and um, how we use, you know, word of mouth and social media into getting this community buy-in and ways that, of ways that we're, we think all the time on how we can get more people to attend the farmer's market. All right, so we're going to open it up for questions and comments and just kind of wanted to have an opportunity and time for you guys to, you know, get out and, and unmute and ask questions or throw them in the chat or whatever you guys would like. We have some folks sharing some good resources on GUSNIP and um, other programs across uh, their states, because I know it is different from state to state on some of these programs. Um, but I'll go back, and you kind of highlighted this a little bit, Megan, but we'll still ask it. Do you have additional vendors? So outside of just a normal food vendor at those farmer's markets? Yeah. So one of the things that, um, again, going back to that community buy-in is that we've seen that people will show up more if there's hot food vendors. And so like people, cause our market is from five to seven on Mondays. And so that's a dinner time. And so people like to come to market and have dinner at the same time. And so like, we even have tables set up and chairs for people to sit and eat at, um, which has been a great benefit, especially our elders love that. They just love to come and, and have dinner at market. And so we have hot food vendors that come through. Um, a lot of them are fundraisers. Like, so we have like eighth grade, um, you know, fundraising or, or um, seniors that are fundraising or, you know, whether it's a football program, wrestling program, they come through and do that as well, which has been a benefit for our community and also brings in a crowd. It brings in that buy-in because people are accessing that. We also have uh, vendors that come from Willow Creek, which is a, a neighboring town from us. It's about 15 miles away um, that do like a freeze-dried um uh, food. So like do, they do like the freeze dried Skittles and, and nerds and stuff like that, which is so cool. And so good. We also have a, a man that does local honey. Um, and these are some non-native vendors as well. Um, they come consistently and they're, they're from neighboring towns or neighboring cities from us. And so they're coming into the market as well that sell not only just the produce or value added product, but sell different products as well too. Awesome. So kind of going back to that one slide again, uh, do the individual vendors have the ability to take credit cards and EBT at the farmer's market? So yes, the some vendors do like Venmo or they'll do like their own, um, they can accept their own credit card. But again, going back to like, if they can't, we have the EBT or credit card machine and we can we can give out the coins that are, you know, able to be used at any one of our vendors. So all of our vendors that go to the farmer's market um, can receive the tokens or the vouchers. Perfect. I think that catches us up on some of the ones that were in our comments, but definitely feel free to add any more there if folks have more um, or you can put in the Q&A or you can just come off mute, whatever you would like to do. While y'all are thinking about coming off a of mute or, or commenting, we can talk about the next 
webinar that we're having in this series. So we keep alluding to it, but that's going to be February 1st at 2 p.m. again. I'll include the registration link in case you all are not registered for it. But Megan, what are some of the things we're going to cover in that? We're going to talk about leveraging funding or leveraging, you know, resources so that you can get your farmer's market up and going. I kind of briefly highlighted like rural development and FNS and USDA, but there are other um, uh, programs that you can access and, and really build up, you know, again, those vendors, that vendor population or just getting uh, things you know, and funding for your market and being able to buy things that are relevant to how your market's going to operate. So that's going to be a really great series and leveraging that funding, also getting that community buy-in and, and, you know, being able to have resources there and available for community members. Um, so that's going to be part of our series coming up and we're going to go more into depth on how to leverage that funding. Perfect. I think that'll be a good one for a lot of folks. Um, to attend so we can get more into the weeds on some of those opportunities that exist to help folks get those farmers markets started in their communities. And I think another thing is that we wanted to try to get an IFAI staff in here and talking about um, like we have a couple of our legal and policy staff that know more about WIC authorization it's different, which it doesn't seem like it should be different than SNAP authorization, but, it, you know, we wanted to definitely highlight that too, as well as like leveraging those programs, because um, we do have a lot of, uh, you know, nursing moms or or uh, young children that can access, um, you know, fresh produce, but through WIC vouchers. All right. Did we have anybody that wanted to ask questions? Oh, we have a hand raised. Yeah. Hi, this is Joanne. Can you guys hear me clear? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we're here. Cool. So my question is, um, how do you um, get a variety? I know you were talking about community buy-in, but how do you guys get a variety of different, let's say, vendors? So let's say you have four vendors showing up and we're all from the same community. And so they all show up with like cucumbers and carrots and, you know, kind of like the same produce. Um, how do you get like a variety? So it's not just the same thing. And the second part of that question would be, how do you help them price their products so that they actually sell? So that's really good. Um, so what we've done is we've kind of got like a local guide of like price, uh, like a local pricing guide that we've been able to access and give out to our producers when we first started from like the neighboring farmer's market. So having that kind of relevant to your community and, and your um, area was good. Another thing that we wanted to kind of let them internally sort out. And this has been something that our producers have done on their own. It's not something that came from us, um, but they actually um, set their prices according to what each other prices are. And so that's something that they've kind of internally sorted out. One thing I can say, though, is that I've not been to a market where there was too many cucumbers, uh, too many tomatoes, too many of some of the product, because a lot of people like that stuff. And so, you know, as long as uh, we can have the producers sell that, um, one of the things that's a hot a hot product for our communities, lemon cucumbers, which a lot of people don't know about, but I guess is something that's very relevant to our community. Um, you know, if a vendor comes with those lemon cucumbers, um, if one vendor has a ton and another vendor has a ton, nine times out of 10, both of them sell out by the end of the night, which has been really cool to see. Um, so it's just kind of something that we we try not to mediate as much as letting the producers um, on their own develop those pricing lists and those pricing guides. And we just kind of like give them resources um, just so that we're not trying to tell anybody, this is what you need to do. This is what you needed to produce. This is, you know, we don't want to be that type of um, uh, farmer's market. We want them to be able to internally um with the resources that they get to decide on what their prices are going to be and what they're going to be bringing uh, according to what the other people are bringing. Um, and the way that we've been able to get diversified product is um, 
those vouchers and, and those EBT benefits have been super beneficial for um, our market. And so we get a lot of people that, um, you know, with the advertisement on social media and stuff that we have those things. We have a lot of vendors that come from, you know, neighboring cities that are like, hey, I have, like I said, the freeze dry lady, the honey man, all those kinds of things that have different products that they want to bring in. And so we're able to kind of select those outside vendors that, um, you know, might not be the same thing that we have coming from our tribal vendors. Thank you. Yeah, Hi. I can. Can you I, hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, in response to that question, the first thing I would think of would be go to your grocery store, go to Cub and see what the cucumbers sell for, see how much the stuff is, and just go from there. And then there's a, I know there's a question about the credit card machine, and I'm an artist by trade, and when I would do shows, they always did. I had to rent the machine from the bank. And so they did take um, a percentage of my, you know, whatever my money was, I had to pay like a rental fee in order to use the machine. But thanks, yes. this has been really super helpful. Awesome, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, and I think they have like a machine, a uh, uh, credit card reader called Square that you can apply for. It's really easy to get and you can hook it into your phone or you can hook it into your iPad um, as long as it has internet capabilities that you can have slide, but it also takes a percentage or a fee um, to use that system. All right, well, we got a few more minutes for questions. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute and we'll take your questions. The last thing you said did answer one of our last questions, which was, does the credit card machine take a portion of the sale? So, Yeah, there's always a fee associated with the bank um, with regards or the operating system that, that you use. Again, we were able to get funding for the first two years from the local North Coast Growers Association that actually paid for those fees for us um, just because we we're starting farmer's market until we were established. So you might be able to find or leverage funding um, from a local organization that could help with that. Yeah, so I think that our future webinars can focus on recommendations of managing a market and market structure. Um, yeah, I think that's a definitely uh, ties into our next upcoming webinars and, and what we'll be talking about and focusing on. Um, it's definitely something that we think of every year here in Hoopa is like how, you know, we could better manage it, the structure of it. Um, you know, there is like a, a, a underlying hierarchy, I guess, of vendors, like this is my spot, this is your spot, like how do you deal with those differences and, uh, and uh, be able to mediate in between that as a host organization. Again, you know, we we provide this market, but it is definitely their market um, if they're vendors and we're just kind of like the host that helps with it. Um, and how do we, are, how are we able to mediate and, and navigate that relationship is pretty, it's, it's definitely a conversation. And this could, you know, inspire us to do a few more in this series. We only have three planned for right now with this first one happening today, but there might be some more areas that we want to dive into deeper. So your feedback can be really critical in you know, what we might do in the future to being able to serve you guys in the best way. Um, we did have a few more questions come in, Megan, in our comments. Um, one person asked, what's your most exciting story or good memory of managing the market? And then is there a concern for insurance for any of the vendors? I am so glad you asked the question about my favorite moments at market. And, you know, there's just so many, but I would have to go back to COVID. And um, when we had a lot of isolation, uh, we had a lot of elders that had been in isolation for a long time. And, you know, it was really hard on them. 
our senior center shut down. So we didn't have a senior nutrition center, which were that where our elders go and get their lunches and it's their time of community and their time of, you know, fellowship with one another that was shut down. And so, um, you know, they did come and say, Hey, we don't think that it's safe for you guys to hold har farmer's market any longer, which was a, which was a blessing for us, even though at the time we did get shut down one night and, um, they moved us to a new location, which is in front of our, our local tribal office, which now we are on green grass and we have trees and shade. So that was a huge benefit of us being moved. Um, so, you know, uh, was, was great during that time to, to be shut down, but you know, it sucked. Uh, but I remember when we were opening up and we had our elders coming in and they were just so happy to see one another and talk to one another, you know, and, and they felt like they were safe to come to our farmer's market because we had, you know, guidelines where you couldn't touch the produce. Only only the um, producer was able to, you know, bag your stuff and, and hand it out. So they felt super safe to come to our market and access that food. But it was that sense of being able to get out of isolation and being able to come together you know, we seen some uh, hugging going on, which, you know, we we didn't uh, we didn't growl at them for um, because we understood that, you know, that that was their time to get out. But it was definitely such a great moment to watch them feel that they were able to get out and and have a sense of community and get out of isolation. So those are those are great memories that I hold. Um, other memories are just, you know, being able to see everybody come together and laughing and sharing stories and. Um, you know, I, I've been working with IFAI for the last year. And so I've been kind of in an area where I am not able to be as hands-on with our farmer's market. And it is kind of like, like, um, one of my babies that I've been able to help to, to nourish in my community, but to see it continue without me having to be there. Um, you know, one day I sat at farmer's market and watched the people that took over and, and being able to run the farmer's market. And I just kind of started crying because I was like, you know, this is this is something that's not happening just because I've been able to help it going. But it's something that's happening because people actually care that it happens and it's not just me. And so those are great memories and great things that I see. And it's just I'm just thankful to be able to help to get it up and going in my community. Great story, Megan, as always. I love hearing your stories. Um, I did want to come back to that last question that we have, and I think this will be the last one because we're nearing the three o'clock mark here, um, but on insurance. Is there a concern for insurance for any of the vendors? So the KTRCD, we hold um, liability insurance up to um, $4 million. Um, and we, we're we required to have that insurance through the SNAP-Ed program that we, we leverage funding from. So that actually covers our um, farmer's market as well. So it's not a, we don't have an issue with insurance um, for us at the market, you know, but what happens outside that market with those vendors is is not underneath us. Well, Miigwech, thank you everyone for attending today. I did just put in the chat the link to our next webinar, but we look forward to having you join us here again. And like I said at the beginning, we are recording this, so we'll get it up on our YouTube and website, and I'll send out an email to you as well directly. So you'll have access to the recording and these slides as well. But again, Chi Miigwech, and hope you guys have a fantastic day. Thank you guys. We appreciate your time and uh, thank you for all your questions and comments. It really means a lot that you guys are excited to take part in our series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.